Time of death, 10:15. Let's head live to McAllister, Oklahoma, where the state of Oklahoma has executed another death row inmate, Scott Eisenberg. So the order of things this morning is going to be, uh, I'm going to introduce the director, Stephen Arp, here in a minute. He will come in and he'll read a statement, take a few questions. Uh, after the director leaves, uh, we're going to have two representatives from the victim's family, uh, Johnny Melton, the nephew of Patsy Cantrell, and Justin Wyatt, a grandson of the Cant Cantrells, and they will be appearing to speak. Uh, and after they are done, uh, we'll hear from our five media witnesses and our order today will go Sean will lead us off from the Associated Press, then Lori Fulbright from KOTV, then Caitlin Ogle from KFOR, then Andrea Eager Canfield from the Tulsa World, and Dylan Goforth from the Frontier. So, cue the director for Yes, uh, Johnny Melton, J-O-H-N-N-Y, Melton, M-E-L-T-O-N, and then Justin, normal spelling, Wyatt, W-Y-A-T-T, -T. that's a grandson. Wyatt, what was his relation? Justin Wyatt's a grandson. And Johnny's what? Nephew of Nephew. Patsy Cantrell. Yeah. So at this time we're going to hear from uh, Director Steve Hart. Thank you, Josh. So good morning. I have a fairly lengthy uh, statement I'll make real quick and then be happy to take any questions. Today, the Oklahoma Department of Corrections carried out the court-ordered sentence of inmate Scott Eisenberg, who was convicted of murder in the first degree. Inmate Eisenberg received his last meal at 5.10 p.m. on January 11th and exercised his option to have a spiritual advisor present with him in the chamber. The execution process began at 10.01, and inmate Eisenberg was declared unconscious at 10.07. He was declared deceased at 10.15 a.m. Today's events and the circumstances which led to it have affected many people, especially the Cantrell family and all those who were victimized by Ember's actions. My thoughts are with them, and I hope the outcome of this case brings them some semblance of peace. As an agency, we carried out the orders of the court in accordance with our high standards of professionalism and respect for those in our custody, ensuring dignity for everyone involved in the process. The decision to allow this activist spiritual advisor to be present in the chamber was made only with the support of the victim's family. In order to be allowed in the chamber, the designated clergy had to agree to a strict no-tolerance code of conduct. Previously, clergy selected by inmates <coughs> excuse me, to be in the chamber have been more known to the warden, our H unit section chief, and other prison staff. Through this regular contact, they were able to determine whether or not a clergy member may represent a security threat inside the chamber. The designation of clergy must be made 25 days in advance. This window is needed for our investigators to vet and approve the witness list. This is a functioning maximum security prison, and security will always be the most important factor of any decision we make. The activist in this instance came from out of state just a few months ago, and his intentions were not immediately uh, clear to staff. However, once he was selected to be with Eisenberg in the chamber, our investigators discovered multiple arrests for active, activist stunts and his public comments vowing to use our bodies to stop executions. Taking this person at their own word meant the agency had to consider him a significant security concern. Currently, there are 21 active religious volunteers who minister specifically to the inmates on H unit. These important volunteers come from all faiths and backgrounds. They go cell to cell, ministering to the spiritual needs of inmates uh, on a daily basis. We respect the commitment of these volunteers and we permit an activist spiritual advisor to use the media coverage surrounding an execution as our own personal fundraiser. All clergy present in the chamber must abide by code of conduct. The one agreed to in the case was even more specific regarding the boundaries for conduct and the consequences of any breach of the agreement. The agreement clearly stated, among other things, that the spiritual advisor in this case would not say or do anything that disrupts the safety and security of the execution or diminish his respect for the witnesses. Everyone is and should be entitled to their own opinions about the death penalty. It's a complex, very complex issue. But something affirmed by a vote of the people and carried out by order of the courts, this agency must do what we can to protect the dignity of the process. We will guard against outside agitators who would come in to corrupt the process in any way and potentially line their own pockets. At this time, there's no plan in place to amend any of the rules we have for clergy. The agency will continue to ensure the security through the careful vetting of all witnesses, making decisions on a case-by-case -case basis. 
I'll take whatever questions you got. Uh, Director, I, I noticed there is a, uh, a member of the execution team inside the chamber whose function appears to be to monitor the spiritual advisor. Yes. Um, can, you, can you tell me, did, uh, does that person have a non lethal weapon with them? No, so that we actually have security on both sides of that door for such a purpose, but there's no weapons involved. We don't allow those in, in well, in the process, in the prison, anywhere. So if something happened, we would use uh, training and techniques that they have for hand-to-hand -to, -hand to get someone out the door. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I think there was a, an exchange of, um, well, for example, Reverend Hood told me he loved him, told him that the members of death, uh, on death row supported him. You know, it was more of a moment of um, giving him confidence, giving him support, giving him some feeling as he, as he passes that there were people there that cared about him and loved him. Any more questions from the director? Thank you. That was Director of the Corrections Department, Stephen Harp, giving some of the details leading up to the lethal injection death of Scott Eisenberg. Eisenberg is a double murderer convicted years ago of the murder of two people in Creek County, Oklahoma, an elderly couple, A.J. Cantrell and Patsy Cantrell. We expect now to hear from two family members of the Cantrell family, Johnny Melton, who is a nephew of the couple, and Justin Wyatt, who is a grandson. As we wait a few minutes for that family, the director of corrections spelled out the last minutes of Eisenberg's life. The process began at 10.01 this morning. At 10.07, Scott Eisenberg was declared unconscious by a doctor in the execution chamber. He was pronounced dead at 10.15 this morning. We know that he was accompanied by his spiritual advisor, a reverend who had got to know him in the past few months. There was a legal battle this week leading up to this execution regarding the presence of that spiritual advisor. Joining us first, he's making his way in now. Uh, both family members will be speaking from prepared statements today, and they've been kind enough to provide us some printed copies that we will share with you after this is all done. So you can get those from me over here. All right, and now we are preparing to hear from two family members of the Cantrell family. A few years ago, when Oklahoma's execution, execution protocol was overhauled, one of the portions they added to this section of the open portion of the execution process was to include the victim's family members if they chose to be included in this execution process. Of course, family members have long witnessed executions in Oklahoma, but it wasn't until last year that we began to hear from the family members most affected by the execution. We begin now with Johnny Melton and Justin Wyatt. Hello, uh, I'm Justin Wyatt. I'm, uh, Thank everybody for being here today. I know it's, you know, not a good day for everybody, but uh, today was a good day for victims. I don't know if today was justice. I don't know if today was closure. I'm not sure it was ever about any of those things for us. It would do um, this painful journey and injustice to say that this was one thing or another. It's been more than that could ever be labeled. Maybe today was a bookend for another day that happened almost 20 years ago with a whole lot of stories in between. I do know that I'm glad that our enemy is dead. Some battles were forced to fight in life and they can only have one ending. Um, make no mistake about it, we won that battle today. I believe this was the only way to end the nightmare my family has endured all these years. Nevertheless, it has now come to its conclusion, and for me, a time to be cut completely free of all of this and continue on with our lives. AJ and Patsy Cantrell's legacy can now live on beyond all of this. 
My hope is that their memory can pull itself further and further away from this darkness and be seen in light once again, void of his name, which I'm not going to say today. It's not worth me saying his name. And all I've ever wanted is to detach their memory from him. Unfortunately, this painful process has taken way too long to reach its conclusion here today. Unfortunately, many, many people are not able to be here with us today because this took too long. But they were all here. <clears throat> I promise you they were in our hearts. Many, many people through all these years and all these days have made this way more difficult than it ever needed to be. But far, far more people have shown more love and more support than I don't know that we even deserved. But I will always remember both sides of that. I want to thank everyone for their friendship, kindness, prayers, patience, and their love. Some have been with us through this whole thing, some early and some later, but they've all been impactful and important on our journey. Yes. And love to them all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just want to make a short statement. Uh, I don't know if everyone knows this, in the midst of this tragedy, uh, before the trial began, our sis my, my sister Linda was murdered by her boyfriend, shot in the head and he then turned his, the gun on himself. So we had her funeral on Saturday and started the trial in El Reno for him on Monday. So we've had a double impact, a family of five and, and three, you know, killed with, by homicide. It's kind of unheard of. So we've gone through double the pain. And it's, you know, it's, it's been a journey, a long, painful journey. And I don't believe in closure. I don't like people to use that word to me because the only way we would ever have closure is if they came back to us. And we know that's not going to happen on this earth. But I know we'll be together again. And uh, I appreciate my whole family for being here for me. I needed, I needed them. And my sister, Marcia, wasn't physically able to come. But, you know, we've been in touch with her. And she's, you know, she was... She's in my heart all the time. She's right here with us. So, thank you. Deborah, D-E-B-R-A, Cantrell, Wyatt. Yeah, my, my, my dad, mom. Hmm? Statements from the Cantrell family that has certainly endured their fair share of tragedy, a number of murders in their family over the years. My name is Johnny Melton, and I have been asked to give this statement on behalf of the family of Patsy and A.J. Cantrell. Patsy and A.J. were my aunt and uncle. Patsy and my dad were uh, brother and sister. After nearly 20 years, justice was carried out today. Scott Eisenberg has now paid his debt to society. Mr. Eisenberg was in prison for nearly 20 years. My family has been held in another type of prison, a prison consisting of emotional and mental anguish. Through every court date, every appeal, through every hearing, we were held captive hanging on every decision. There's no closure today, but a page has been turned and a, a fresh chapter in our lives has begun. After living this nightmare, I must say that 20 years is too long for justice to be served. We want to get it right we absolutely want to get it right. We want everyone's rights to be protected, but the process is much too slow. The mental anguish that goes into waiting on this lengthy process is absolutely excruciating. First and foremost, we are people of faith, and our prayers have been for Mr. Eisenberg and his family. It is our understanding that he has adult children and other family members and we recognize that they are victims today too. And we cannot possibly fathom what their thoughts and feelings have been for the past 20 years, especially today. They too have suffered a great loss and we pray that God will comfort them and bring peace. Our prayer has been that Mr. Eisenberg find peace. We pray that he has repented for his actions and was granted the gift of grace and accepted by his creator. 
Today is not a day of celebration, nor is it a day of victory. However, it is a day of justice. At times, justice seems harsh, but it is necessary to retain order and balance in a nation guided by laws that are designed to serve and protect the people. There are many individuals that have walked through this journey with us, and we're very grateful for each one. But first and foremost, thanks be to God for holding us up during our darkest hours. God has blessed us with many friends and family who have stood by us through this long and stressful ordeal. We found tremendous comfort from the phone calls, the messages, the cards, most of all the hugs and the shoulders offered to cry on when we needed that release the most. No words could ever express our gratitude. The folks at the Department of Corrections have been absolutely wonderful. They have made this very difficult process much easier with their professionalism and compassion toward our family. There are a number of people who were involved in helping us maneuver through this process. Karen Cunningham, who serves as the Victim Services Coordinator, as well as the entire staff at the Attorney General's Office, were extremely helpful as they guided us through this course of action. We must also mention Assistant Attorney Generals uh, Carolyn Hunt and Tessa Henry. The work and dedication that these folks have in serving the great state of Oklahoma is absolutely amazing. They truly ha have servants' hearts, and we are grateful for their service. We would also like to thank the Pardon Pro Board for their service to the people of Oklahoma during the clemency hearing for Mr. Eisman. Their responsibilities require compassion for both sides as well as level-headed, impartial thinking. We thank them for their courage and wisdom as well as their empathy for all, all involved. Finally, we would like to thank the district attorney's office that served Creek County, the judge and the members of the jury. They sat through days and days of testimony and evidence and uh, they were presented, that was presented to them. Our family thought it would be very easy to come to a conclusion of first degree murder for both Patsy and AJ. The fact that the only first degree murder conviction was for AJ lends to the fact that this was not a kangaroo court. Mr. Eisenberg received a fair trial with competent jurors and all the evidence was weighed and thoroughly examined. This is the first time publicly that we have been able to express our thanks to all of these folks and we are deeply grateful for their dedication to the legal process. Our family has suffered for years because of this cruel and senseless murder that took the lives of my aunt and uncle. If we live long enough, we will all lose someone that we dearly love, but to lose someone to murder is a pain that no one should ever experience. They didn't have the opportunity to tell what really happened. With that said, my cousin Deborah Cantrell Wyatt has done an amazing job lifting their voice as she introduced them as the wonderful people that they were. Now that this chapter has closed, we will move forward and treasure the beautiful memories we hold in our hearts. In conclusion, I think something must be said about domestic violence in general. Something must be done to address this crisis in our country, but especially in our state. Before I go on, I must uh, say again and repeat that we have a, another hole in our heart. My cousin, Linda Cantrell, would be standing here beside us today. But she too was a victim of domestic violence and was murdered by her boyfriend before he took his own life, only days before the Eisenberg trial began. This insanity must stop. Our prayer is that God can create something good from all of the darkness and sadness that surrounds us. Uh, statistically, Oklahoma is one of the states leading the nation in deaths as a result of domestic violence. One in four women will experience domestic violence in their lifetime. It must stop. We are better than this. I wish I had the answer, but sadly, I don't. We need to take a serious look at the fabric of our society as it pertains to mental health. There are not enough avenues available for folks that need help, that, that, uh, and this must be corrected. This crisis will never end. It will only get worse. We need to educate our young people. We need to teach them how to identify danger signs in relationships before it turns violent. It starts with us. If you have a daughter, educate her. Tell her very clearly that if someone shows their hand 
and indicates that they could become physically aggressive, do not ignore it. If someone shows you who they are, believe them. Get away and report it. Bad behavior that can lead to violence must be exposed so that individual can get the help that they need. I know this is going to be a controversial statement, but I believe it to be a fact. It's the abuser who needs the help. They need it when they're young. By the time the victim needs the help, it's too late. We must somehow learn to identify potential abusers and get them the help that they need before destroying their life and perhaps in someone else's. Some Thank heartfelt words from the family of the victims of Scott Eisenberg. Scott Eisenberg was put to death at 1015 today. More on the execution process of Scott Eisenberg. We'll hear from some additional witnesses. Our own Caitlin Ogle was in the execution chamber today, as well as more from family members during our news newscast and later broadcast right here on News 4.